Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader. Today, our guest is Peter Godfrey Smith, author of Metazoa. Animal Life and the Birth of the Mind, published in November by Farrar, Strauss, and Jarrell. Peter is a professor in the School of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Sydney. His main research interests, as we will see, are in the philosophy of biology and in the philosophy of mind. He has written six books, the last of which being the acclaimed Other Minds, the octopus, the sea, and the deep origins of science. He spends a lot of time in the well in the water. Uh, welcome, Peter, and thanks so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Many times, I feel that the best way to start a book is by talking about the title and the cover. So, as a bookshop owner, I'm sometimes dismayed and sometimes heartened that, notwithstanding the old saying, every judge, every customer who comes into the store judges a book by its cover. And yours is a lovely one. So let's talk about the title first. So Metazoa, um, my understanding is a group that comprises all animals, even us. So maybe you could amplify on that as the beginning word of this title. Sure, yes. So the word, the word Metazoa is an old fashioned word for the animal kingdom, basically. It refers to all the animals considered together as a group. It was introduced in contrast with the word protozoa to refer to single celled animals. And originally it meant something a bit like the higher animals, but that side of its meaning has faded and really it's just a general word, although an old fashioned one for the animals. So the point of the book is to talk about the animal kingdom. Now, one of the reasons I liked the title was the fact that in in modern English, especially kind of academic or philosophical English, the word meta from a Greek word has these connotations of, of looking down on or about, like a meta language is a language used to talk about another language. So meta has the connotation of aboutness and surveying the whole of the animal kingdom. So that's, that's the explanation of the title. Now, the, the image on the American edition, uh, it, it's just the most beautiful, it's the most beautiful painting. Uh, it was painted by Roger Swainston, who is an Australian painter who specializes in marine life. And if people go to his website, uh, just Google Roger Swainston, you'll see that he does the early versions of many of his illustrations uh, on scuba, underwater, uh, using waterproof drawing materials. He's really down there in the sea trying to get a sense of the just the, 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 whole, the wholeness of the scene that he wants to capture. So he's a specialist in, in marine animals, fish especially, but not only fish. And this particular illustration is a painting of a leafy sea dragon, which is, roughly speaking, a relative of seahorses. It's close to the seahorses, so it's a fish in that group, only found in one pretty small area at the bottom of Australia. I've never seen a leafy sea dragon in the wild, I'm sorry to say. I'm going to have to get down there uh, once travel is easier. But that's the animal, and they are just the most beautiful, unearthly, astounding creatures. And it's funny because if a reader looks at it and judges or prejudges, they would not know whether this was a book on botany or if it was a book on animals. And that's what's so cool about it. I'm, do you have the book right there? Did you pull up the cover? Yes, I'll just go and it'll just take me a second uh, to go and get it. Because yeah, I had a proof and I didn't actually have the cover. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, there's the American cover with the Roger Swainston illustration. And I also brought back, while I was grabbing this one, this is the UK cover. And that is a different kind of sea dragon. So it's a relative of the leafy sea dragon. This one's called a weedy sea dragon. And they're not quite so rare. So those I've seen in the wild uh, around Sydney, uh, also very beautiful, uh, very strange, unearthly animals. It's funny. I like ours better. I don't know why, but I just like them better. They're both great. Uh, I'm not just saying that to be diplomatic. I think they're both great covers. They are. And the funny, the other thing, again, being uh, a bookseller is in nonfiction books now, I always notice the colon, which is basically an expansion or an explanation of the first word. So we have metazoa and then we have the word animal letting us know that we're part of that group. And then the key to your entire book and why you're a philosopher as well as a scientist is this idea of awareness or the idea of a mind. So deductively, we go from this group, which we start thinking this is just a group of little tiny things. Then you recognize that it's us. And then you recognize that it's much like the cover of a jigsaw puzzle. You see the picture on the outside and you know the same thing is on the inside, but it's up to the reader to put all those pieces together. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, after the colon, you're expanding on the actual word. And what are you trying to tell us in that as, as our entry into this world that you create? Right. So the book takes the form of a kind of a journey, really, a, a tour or a journey through the animal kingdom or through a large part of the animal kingdom where there's a particular agenda or perhaps a kind of dual agenda to the journey. Uh, there's, there's a couple of things we're trying to understand as we go. Ostensibly, the tour that the book goes on or, or the journey uh, has the form of a single long scuba dive in some ways where we encounter sponges, corals, crustaceans, cephalopods such as the octopus, fish and others. And the journey is organised at that level around the genealogical relationships between different kinds of animals. So everything, everything we meet in the water is, is alive now. We're not literally visiting ancestors of ourselves. But the various animals that we encounter contain clues about our history, about our ancestors, and about the, the shape and the general form taken by the, the tree of life, the genealogical tree that links all animals on Earth. Now, I said there's a kind of dual agenda, and that has to do with the fact that it's not merely an attempt to work our way through this historical tree, but to understand how, in some kind of evolutionary process, some natural biological process, the evolution of animals gave rise to the evolution of experience, subjective experience, uh, the mind in one sense of the mind, the ability to feel things as they happen, the ability to experience our lives and not merely have our lives occur. I think that the way to make progress on the classic mind-body problem, uh, the, the sort of huge and very puzzling question of how experience can exist in a physical, biological world. The way to make progress on that is by a kind of historical uh, a historical path where we explore different ways in which animals live, uh, different kinds of behaviours they have, how their various quirks and the ways they live may have evolved. And the hope is, I mean, the the guiding hope of the book is that as we work through this story, this historical story, it starts to become explicable why some things on earth have subjective experience, why they experience their lives, and consequently how there comes to be the birth of the mind. 
Well, guess, okay, as we further go into <clears throat> the beginning of the interior, again, I think as a bookseller, I'm always interested in the epigraph because it seems to me as if the author spent a lot of time thinking about it. And yours is a fairly substantial one. And I think I know what it means, but we're talking about this kid on the Pequod in Moby Dick, and he's not quite doing his job. But what you're saying is, you know, maybe the job he's doing is just as important. Maybe not to the guys who are trying to catch the whale. Um, so you can either, if you'd like to read it, that's fine, or you can just explain it. I'm not going to read it in part because uh, when I did the audio version of this book, so I read the audio myself this time, unlike the, the previous book, Other Minds. And having chosen the Melville epigraph, I had a go at recording it and I just thought I can't do this thing justice. Uh, so I got an opera singer, uh, <laughs> a, a very good somewhat avant-garde opera singer, Mitch Riley, who's an Australian singer now based in Paris, to record, and it turned out remotely, we had to do this by sending files backwards and forwards from Paris to Australia, to record uh, the quotes, the epigraph and the other quotes that were used uh, in the book. And his rendition of the Melville is so good that I'm just going to have to direct people to the audio. Let me say something, though, about given that we're talking about epigraphs, in a sense, there are two epigraphs in the book. There was the one that was used, that's the Melville, and the one I had long intended to use but did not use, uh, which is discussed in the first chapter as a kind of lost epigraph. And that's a passage by a mathematician, Alexander Grotendieck. And so Grotendieck was a very unusual guy even by mathematician standards. Uh, he was a political radical who became an extreme recluse, gave up doing research mathematics, having done extremely important work, work that had a, a high degree of abstraction, again, even by the standards of pure mathematics. And at, at one point in some informal writings of his, he described the approach that he took to solving intractable problems. Okay, and this passage I'm happy to read. So let me just find the passage. Um, so Grotendieck is talking about encountering a problem and being unable to solve it. And the way that he would approach problems of this kind is by building knowledge around the problem, uh, gradually accumulating knowledge around the area where the solution should be, rather than continuing with a kind of fruitless direct attack, and hoping that gradually, as you build around the problem, the shape of the problem will become transformed, and then it will uh, it will essentially disappear. The problem will, will be resolved. So he, he wrote about this using a metaphor of a rising sea. So here's the Grotendieck. He says, the sea advances insensibly and in silence. Nothing seems to happen and nothing is disturbed, but it finally surrounds the stubborn substance, which little by little becomes a peninsula, then an island, then an islet, which itself becomes submerged, as if dissolved by the ocean stretching away as far as the eye can see. So the image is the transformation and solution of a problem by building knowledge around it and a kind of aquatic submersion of the problem. Now, for years I had that at the front of the text while I was writing the book, and I thought of that as really capturing the, the kind of indirect evolutionary approach that I was taking to the mind-body problem. But at a certain point, I realized that the image of an island being submerged beneath an ocean now has a totally different and inappropriate set of connotations uh, at a, in a time of climate change, where we have these, these precious uh, Pacific islands, you know, as we speak, being essentially swallowed by rising waters due to climate change. So it was a completely unsuitable uh, epigraph for the book, given that. 
but as I say in chapter one, it does guide my approach to the mind body problem. I think that as we, as we make our way from animal to animal, seeing how they live, seeing what their bodies are like, how their senses and their bodies are related, how a nervous system of a different kind coordinates the actions of that body and what is being sensed. As we sort of make our way from animal to animal in that process, there is a kind of accumulation of understanding of how it can be possible for experience to exist in a biological world. So the rising sea image was a kind of, it's a kind of, I think of it as the lost epigraph or the, uh, the, the yeah, the lost epigraph to the book. Okay, I'm going to read because I love the book. I am going to read another portion of it, and I want to know whether you think it's apt. Where Ahab says, "Is it not curious that so vast a being as the whale should see the world through such a small eye, and hear the thunder through an ear which is smaller than a hair's? But if his eyes were as broad as the lens of Herschel's great telescope, and his ears capacious as the porches of cathedral." <laughs> Would that make him any longer of sight or sharper of hearing? Not at all. Why then you, do you try to enlarge your mind, subtilize it? And that the only reason I say that is because it seems relevant in that the greatest of minds do not have to have the largest of courtesies or the most complexity. I don't know. Is that apt? It is. Uh, and it's it's such a love. It's a lovely passage um another lovely piece of melville um i would differ with it a little so if one wonders if one wonders whether it would make a difference to have a body of quite a different form what kind of difference that would have for experience i mean part of the point of the book metazoa is that the body really matters uh, the the form of the body that animal an animal has uh, makes a difference not just with respect to the obvious details you know if you have a if you have a bigger eye you can see more or an eye of a different design you can see differently not just with respect to the relatively obvious details but with respect to um, The, the broadest kinds of properties that experience might have. So he, here's, here's an example of a, a contrast that, that's important at a, at a certain point in the book. Um, if you are a crustacean, such as a shrimp, so one of the important characters is a banded shrimp that has this incredible profusion of appendages, but is also very mobile and must be continually encountering with these feelers and claws and all these very extended hard part appendages, must be encountering objects in space and having to deal with the fact that all of the animal's own motions have consequences for what it will sense. And if it wants to work out what's going on externally, it has to filter out the consequences of its own motions. So if you have a crustacean body... As I imagine it, you have an extremely spatialized kind of experience. You know, your ex you, the kind of experience would be natural to expect the animal to have is one with a great deal of sort of location in space. And, a, you know, crustacean bodies occupy space in a special kind of way. Contrast that to an octopus. So an octopus has appendages, as a shrimp does, but it has no hard parts and it appears likely that the control that an octopus has over where its arms are going at any given moment is partial, most likely. It's, it's not a fine grained control of every detail of the motion of the sort that would make sense or is, is readily available once you have hard exoskeleton type parts or, or bones like ours but something more inherently fluid and unpredictable and consequently, I think, chaotic uh, from an experien experiential point of view. Now, an octopus is also tasting everything it touches. So you have these semi-autonomous arms with a kind of uncertain relationship, with uncertain relationships to the whole in space, at least as experienced from the, from the centre, 
and everything that's touched being tasted. Now, one of the things the book tries to do is work out what experience would be like if you have one body rather than the other. And then we go on to look at fish. Uh, fish have this extraordinary sensory system called the lateral line system, where the whole body is, in a sense, a gigantic ear. Um, there are sort of things analogous to the hair cells, perhaps more than analogous to the hair cells in our inner ears, sort of all along the body of the fish, and tiny changes in pressure and vibration can be sensed. Uh, it is a bit like having a body that is an ear, uh, even bigger than what Melville was imagining there. And this takes us back to the Grottendieck lost epigraph. I mean, part of the hope of the book is that by walking through from animal to animal, thinking about their body, the relationship between that body and their senses, how it lives, what it has to deal with, how it encounters events and objects in the world, the the place of experience in the lives of animals will just start to make sense. It's funny. I like the way you took away one of his legs. Well, I didn't. His his leg was just. <laughs> his leg was. Uh, his leg was not there. But he had plenty. <laughs> but he had plenty. He had about a dozen extra appendages still. So, so you mentioned octopus in your last book, the Sealopods. They, you, you know, I had Cy Montgomery on the show, and she appeared at our bookstore who wrote The Soul of an Octopus, which was romantic and playful. But what struck me so much was the stories about how, how they can fit themselves into a little jar, and the same jar they can twist the tops off. And we're mm -hmm. talking, or you're talking about it being one of the most if not the most intelligent creatures after us. And I would not say that. I, I, I think that's saying too much. Right. I, I, uh, so let me, yeah, let, let's talk about that for, for a few minutes. I think that there isn't really a scale, firstly. So I think it's, it's not really true that there's a kind of ranking with us and then perhaps dolphins or chimps and then various others with a kind of linear order there. I, I would resist that kind of comparison but even granting that um even taking into account the fact that different animals are smart in different very many many different ways and that a ranking is a bad model even taking that into account i think it is possible to overstate the smartness of octopuses i think they are behaviorally complex animals and i think they're experientially complex animals but in a way, smartness is just the wrong term to be using about them. I think that's not how they encounter the world in a kind of ruminative, clever way, which is, incidentally, the way that I think birds often encounter the world. I think birds are sort of crafty, ruminative animals that often seem to think through a problem before they physically explore it. Whereas an octopus, I think, probably does not do that. Physical exploration, bodily exploration is, is the way octopuses do things. So I think smartness is in some ways misleading. But also I think it's important to remember that although among invertebrates, they are quite extraordinary with these very large nervous systems and uh, all sorts of uh, very surprising capacities, quite sophisticated learning, an interest in novelty, things like that, they have those things, but um, birds and dolphins and chimps are a, 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 a different a different proposition altogether. It's funny, though, you know, most people think, OK, they can use tools. And it's always that idea of unscrewing the cap or climbing on board a ship and looking around and seeing things. But mm -hmm. it's that screwing of the cap that makes most people feel like, oh, wow, they can do things that we can do. And yeah, so, okay, there it is. I mean, well, okay, skip that. Let's just talk about sentience, which mm -hmm. is partially why you're a philosopher as well as a scientist. I mean, whether you're talking about panpsychism or not, do you, and th then you, you modify the word somewhat in your theory, but I've always felt that there is a certain sentience 
in most of everything. I mean, it's just something I've always felt, whether it's an oak tree. And then there's part of me that goes, even if it's a rock. Okay, I was going to ask about the rock. Um, <laughs> I think I think the trees, plants generally are, are looking like an interesting, difficult case to think about because although it's common to talk about sentience in a kind of yes or no, on or off way, it either has it or it hasn't, part of the point of this book, Metazoa, is that a more uh, gradualist or gradient picture is is surely a more accurate one. Uh, there have to be cases in the history of life on Earth where there was kind of something sort of partly or part way to being sentient, but not actually sentient. Uh, that has to have existed uh, somewhere. And if, it, if it's there in the past, uh, given the way evolution works and given the different kinds of organisms around us now, it's quite possible that there are some of those halfway, partway, what Dan Dennett has referred to as hemi-demi-semi cases. Uh, it's likely that those cases are around us now as well. Okay, where do we find them? Well, I'd be looking at animals with small nervous systems, but still animals with nervous systems. And late in the book, I have a go at plants. And with some caution, argue that plants are just doing a different kind of thing. Experience is just not what they're about in a way that with simple animals, I think it's, I mean, I've got to be cautious here, but I think it's quite likely that the hemi, demi, semi sentience or experience is something that is present in some very simple animals. Now the rock I just think is, is just out. And I would ask you, why, why do you, why do you think, that about a rock? Well, first the oak. When I passed an oak one time when I was in a semi-altered state of consciousness, the oak seemed to have emanated, almost communicating to me its essence. It was almost emanating this oakness that this is what I am. I am aware of what I am. I am this living thing that I can communicate to you. There's an, there's an essence to me. Whether that's awareness, I don't know. And then with the rock, the question is, again, this panpsychism idea that the universe itself is sentient, and therefore every element in the universe must therefore be sentient as well. Um, in omnibus, part of us, we look at totem. You know, in each whole, in each piece, the whole repeats itself. The oak. Well, let's, yeah, let's talk about the oak. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying about that kind of experience. And I, I think, right, he, here's how I would, would question it. I would say, and this is, this is following the kind of strategy that, that is, is applied in the book. We'd say, you know, if it was true, that an oak had something that was either sentient or sort of part way to it, some analog of it, it would have to make sense within the life of the oak. It would have to make sense within what the oak does, the way it lives, the problems it solves, the things it has to deal with and so on. And what are those things like? Well, if you're a plant, Achieving the right physical form, you know, having a physical form that enables you to get the resources you need is a big thing. Uh, you can have branches of any number in different directions and different shapes. Once you've got those branches, they can't move. Um, there's a good deal of sensing that goes into the determination of where the branches will be, you know, tracking sunlight and and water sources and things like that. That's what they're about. And it's all happening on a very slow time scale. You know, it's not happening on a on a kind of moment to moment time. You know, the, the moment to moment time scale is mostly characteristic of animal life. Um, in the case of the oak, it would have to be a kind of a very slow kind of form of sentience and one that was attuned to 
the sorts of things that Oaks, unlike us, have to deal with and have to do well. So um, I think those are reasons to think that if one imagines an oak doing something on a kind of human time scale, there's a reason to sort of stop and think, well, no, hang on, does this make sense from the kind of oak's point of view? Does this only make sense from my point of view? Well, it's funny. I, some some poets said that oak, the trees are just slow fireworks. And um, yeah, it's, it's like, it's funny. I've interviewed a couple of authors recently who, I have written books about consciousness and I bring up the idea of solipsism and they get really angry because it kind of goes right into their what they're doing and it screws it all up. But there is the possibility that only one of us is here theoretically talking to the other. But nonetheless, even if that were true, if we both have this or one of us has the sense of awareness, even if the other one that's not here has that sense of awareness, now I'm getting too confusing. But the, the the concept is the same authors that I've interviewed. I go back to 1641 and Descartes and this idea of dualism. And some of them have said, you know, we really haven't gone that far since then. We're pretty much in the same place. So if we go to dualism, are we? Have we made any progress? Have you made progress in that? Yeah, I, th I, th I think we have made progress. I think that um, Descartes' picture of the whole situation uh, was, a, you know, a picture that makes a certain amount of sense if you think there's humans, people, where people also have a kind of special connection to God and there's the whole rest of nature, everything else other than us on Earth. Uh, so there's a kind of divine realm with God there's humans that have a special connection to God and there's absolutely everything else, including animals, plants, other kinds of life, and so on. The kind of dualist view that Descartes had is tempting if you think about that kind of picture as natural. But once you start to think of human beings as animals among other animals and ha as having evolved from other animals and differing from other animals in many important ways, uh, matters of degree, but not being a fundamentally different kind of thing. Um, I think dualism becomes a much, I mean, it's got its difficulties even in the original framing, but it, it acquires a lot more difficulties with, within a kind of evolutionary picture. And part of the point of the book, Metazoa, is to sort of really work through and think as hard as possible about that kind of evolutionary picture where we humans are one branch on the animal part of the tree of life with things that we've inherited from common ancestors that we share with shrimp and with fish and with octopuses and so on. And a lot of continuity between the kind of place we have in the world and the kind of place that they have. So, you know, I, I do think we've come a fair way since the 17th century, you know, and, Putting it briefly, I think that I think that after Darwin, it's just a whole different picture. It's funny to hear you mention God because in your Wikipedia entry and elsewhere when I was doing research for this, one of the things they say each time is he's an opponent of the concept of intelligent design. So this idea, the pseudoscience of intelligent design, you rip apart as I would too. But then you're mentioning God in the same paragraph that you just discussed the duality. Well, historically speaking, I mean, in the history of thinking about the mind, what kind of thing a mind is and how it relates to the rest of the world, the Christian picture has had an enormous influence. So if we go back before the Christian picture to the view of Aristotle, you have a view in which a kind of soul is present in all living things. There's a kind of soul in plants, there's a kind of soul in animals, and the rational soul in humans is a sort of special form of a, something more general that's seen in other living things. So soul unifies life for Aristotle. Now, once you have a Christian picture, all sorts of much sharper divides become either inescapable or at least uh, natural things to to believe in. So a, a sharp divide between humans and other animals, 
a sharp divide between the material world and the immaterial and an immaterial realm. Um, those sharp dualities are not entirely due to the rise of a kind of strongly, a sort of personal God of the Christian kind or of a, another monotheistic kind. They're not totally due to that. But in the history of thinking about the mind in science and philosophy, you know, God has had a hell of an uh, influence, uh, a very important role to play. And I think we're still working through, you know, in some ways, I wouldn't want to overstate this, but in some ways looking back to the, the kind of view that Aristotle had where there's a lot more continuity between different kinds of life. I don't want to overstate that. Um, as you can tell, I'm being sort of quite abrupt about that because I think Aristotle is getting extremely good press in philosophy, not always for good reason at the moment. Uh, I'm not an Aristotelian, but I think on this on this one issue, there is a kind of there's a kind of looking back over Descartes to Aristotle uh, that's going on. It's funny. I was going to try and paint you into the corner as an Aristotelian. Won't well, work. Can't be done. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you started going on about this idea of everybody having a soul, I was ready to jump on that. Um, it's funny, apropos of nothing, because we're trying to sell your book. When did you first develop, as I still have, which I think is great, when did you first develop the sense of wonder that obviously has pushed you where you are today. Was it when you were a little kid? Is it because you're from Australia and the Great Barrier Reef is there and you went underwater? What was it that first started you off saying, and it, and it wasn't saying I'm gonna be a scientist and it wasn't, gonna, it wasn't saying I'm gonna be a philosopher, it was saying they, they melded together. I would, I would mostly not point to a moment and think of it as a pretty, gradual process. I guess that's in some ways natural given the themes of the book, a kind of gradualist view. Um, I became a more outdoorsy person uh, at a particular stage in my young adulthood. I was a bit more of an urban person before that. I did learn to scuba dive and began spending a bit of time in the Australian, in the sort of wilder shoreline areas of Australia. Uh, then went off and, and studied philosophy in the US after doing a degree in Australia and then stayed working in the US and didn't spend a stack of time in the water for a while. And then as described in the early pages of the book Other Minds, the previous book, there was a sequence of events that really changed everything when I was spending more a bit more time back in Australia and in the water and began to encounter a couple of animals, but in particular, the Australian giant cuttlefish, this completely extraordinary three foot long living video screen uh, animal that often seemed about as interested in me as I was in, in them. That really did change things because then I began to think, okay, this, there's something I have to understand here. I have to understand more about what's going on inside animals like this that are very far from me in evolutionary terms. And from that point onwards, and this is, this is about um, 15 years or so ago now, the intellectual side and the side that you describe in terms of wonder and you know, trying to get good at photography, underwater photography, all that stuff began to kind of knit together into a single project and metazoa is uh is the the kind of it's the really ambitious worked out thing i've got to in exploring this project so far yeah it's um i should tell the reader because you can't tell yet the photographs in the book actually do tell more than a thousand words because they're so well done and they're so clear that you can really intuit from that much of what you're trying to say in the book. And the other thing is because you spend this time underwater in part, even when you're talking about protozoa and unicellular living things, water flows, if you will, through everything. And yeah, good. Yeah, like right. Explosion of water that's like flowing through these guys and they got to handle it. 
And I never really thought about that. I mean, I've always heard, okay, we're made mostly of water and those yeah. kinds. Of but I never thought of it as being something that started everything off. Yeah. And, and, and uh, uh, that's part of the gestalt switch that I want to sort of encourage uh, in people. When we think about living systems, animal life, life in general, its history. The idea of an aquatic setting and an aquatic medium for uh, all the basic properties of life and all the early stages in the history of in animal evolution. Uh, you know, life on land is special. It's got its own special features. And when we, when, when we pull ourselves up on land in one of the chapters of the book, some things do change, but all of the basics get laid down in this aquatic medium. It's funny, when you talk about the glass sponge, I was really intrigued by the idea that it sits on a tower of silicone dioxide. Because at first I was saying, I was thinking, wait a minute, is he saying that's alive too? And then I thought of all the people that posit that, you know, life forms on other planets could have been based on a lattice of silicone rather than carbon. But that's not what you were saying, right? No, it's just an unusual material uh, used for the hard parts, the skeleton, essentially. Um, there are these puzzles about the role of glass in glass sponges. There are some hypotheses about um, use of light in signaling within the animal and the use of light in signaling between the animal and other creatures. So it's not merely a skeleton. It may have some of those peculiarities as a technology that we see in fiber optic cable. But the point of the glass sponge is, I can sense you're heading, going to take us back towards panpsychism and your sentient rock if we're not careful here as well. Well, okay, well then, you know, a lot of the book deals with this concept of self and the concept of signaling implies to me a concept of self because if you're communicating, there's this thing going around in my head that you actually, it's like, okay, the bacteria in our gut, is that a part of our self or is it just a separate thing going on somewhere else? Okay, that, that's a good question. And actually, this will give me, this is a good way to introduce uh, two themes. One is the fact that it's nearly 2 a.m. here and I should probably, I should I'm, probably I'm the one drinking the wrap coffee. up. I'm the, I'm the one drinking the coffee because I'm sleepy and you're up at one o'clock in the morning. Right. Uh, nearly two. Sure. And, but those questions about the relationship between the parts of a collective or a group. So we are a kind of a collective with our bacteria, the bacteria in our gut as partners in some ways, merely fellow travelers in some ways. It's a sort of uncertain relationship. Then you have cases like uh, honeybees and ants that live in very tightly integrated colonies. The relationship between individual perception, individual life and group level perception, uh, whether there are group minds, whether there can be group sentience, just all those questions about the relationships between um, the particle-like individuals and the larger holes that they uh, live within, these will be tackled in the third book in the series, among other things. So there, there will be a third book, and one of the things that gets totally deferred in Metazoa is all those questions about collectives and individuals. Um, there will also be quite a bit more about language and technology. It's, it's going to be mostly about people, but not solely about people, the third book. Um, but that is where I would point in and in even beginning to answer your question about um, the bacteria in us, colonies, collectives, groups, communities of all kinds. Well, wandering off as I'm, as you can see that I want to do, then for some reason that made me think of, okay, the bacteria in our gut, first of all. And then the idea that water, when it freezes, floats and doesn't sink. <clears throat> is there any part of you that believes in either, in the anthropic principle, either weak or the strong anthropic principle? Oh, not really, no. I'm, I'm a bit cautious about it. 
about those ideas. I don't feel I know enough physics and cosmology to have a very confident opinion, but at least so far, they're not really important parts of my picture or strongly on my radar screen. I will have to think about them at some stage. All right, then let's go to, is it pronounced Haeckel? Haeckel, yeah. Haeckel, you're, you're a scientist that you obviously admire and whose ideas you take off on. One of the ideas that I've always liked of his, but which is totally, not totally, mostly discredited, is that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. It's that's discredited in your mind as well. In that in that general form that Heckel supposed. I mean, Heckel Heckel's one important figure in the book. He's interesting because he was someone who was philosophically ambitious as well as biologically ambitious. He was trying to tell, he was trying to develop evolutionary theory, also trying to address questions about mind and matter. And he was artistically ambitious. He did these extraordinary diagrams and illustrations and paintings uh, of the animal that he studied. Uh, uh, he's uh, just an amazing combination of people in a way. Um, but I, I don't, my view of evolution itself is not strongly influenced by his. Uh, it's more within the tradition that starts with Darwin and then extends through uh, people like Fisher and Wright, uh, the 20th century figures who developed Darwin's theory and who mostly were not concerned with some of the more speculative uh, sides of, of, of Heckel's picture. Heckel. Heckel supported Darwinism, correct? He, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he did. He, he supported and wanted to develop it. I'm going to have to go at this point, I think. Can I ask you one, one last question? Yes. yes. Okay. So at the end of the book, you leave us kind of on tender hooks, which is kind of what I like in a book because it leaves the reader after he reads the book thinking about what the heck? What? All right, now what do I do? And you kind of admit that it's like, okay, I'm at the end, but I'm not quite sure. And that's, I guess, why you're going to the third book. But you know what I mean? Yeah, that's how it is. I mean, there's there's some stuff that I think is fairly solid at the end of Metazoa, but there's a whole bunch of questions that are yet to come or not properly addressed yet. And so there does have to be a third book. Cool. Well, I hope that you'll come back so I can talk about that one because I've learned a lot today. I'd be very happy to. Okay. Thanks so much, Peter, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Okay. It's been a pleasure. See ya.